ईश्वराय विमहे सत्य देवाय धीमहि तन्न सर्व प्रचोदयात ओ साईश्वराय विमहे सत्य देवाय धीमहि तन्न सर्व प्रचोदयात ओ साईश्वराय विमहे सत्य देवाय धीमहि तन्न सर्व प्रचोदयात ऑफरिंग माय हम्बल प्रणाम्स एट द लोटस फीट ऑफ आवर बिलवड मदर साई who seems to be teaching each week multiple lessons the first one is wife here when i am here that is the process that i go through each week and uh, um looking for a speaker it also brings me uh, dawns on me to follow the saying start early drives Safely, right? Slowly, read safely. That is also a message that is coming to me, saying that you know what, uh, you can always come back and ask me for that special favor. I can keep pressing the buttons, but one day you're going to run out of credit. So that is also a message that is coming. So today we have someone coming back to the series uh, with a googly uh, that has been bowled at him, which starts off with Anna, can you help getting a speaker? so this is probably he probably knows this story tagline by now very well uh, uh and i guess he's probably used to it being someone who's teaching i'm sure when it comes to submissions of assignments you know there are a lot of creative ways of coming up with an excuse and mine is no better asking him to speak so it started off the journey the speak at least to build up a story the journey started off where the sos would come when thursday i can't type who is the speaker for the week different reasons and there is no point in giving excuse for that and then the earnestness with which uh, uh, our speaker today goes about pressing the buttons taking the phone calling messaging checking whether there's a blue tick green tick whatever you know is amazing which shows that every one of us would like to be in this satsang with sai because it is sai who is speaking through each one of them that it goes to the extent normally uh, saturday by the time our bhajans happen in singapore the speaker would have been finally so i said okay sairam i'm praying to you let me get that miracle call there was a call that came from our speaker who said i said anna i'll call you back i thought he is already confirmed the speaker and then when it came there is a green tick but there is no answer and that went and went and went and at about midday today i thought shall i send a message to all saying we might not be having a satsang and as you should satyarna who is part of this would never accept anything called a no he said have you asked gopi anna and i said i have not but i will be so we waited till we knew that the speaker that we thought who was going to speak today might not get to speak for various reasons which are beyond our understanding but swami knows that very well that the choice of today speaker happened where this person had to agree to speak and we have heard him we have heard his beautiful story coming in from a family devoted to swami where the journey started off uh, with the balvikas tri seva the first very batch of it then uh, then uh, moving on to study his undergraduate post graduate going on to become the first batch of phd students in biosciences in puttaparthi uh, moving on to do a second doctoral degree uh, and then going on to do a degree in law as well you know among the qualifications uh someone who is connected to a topic where, which goes as swami says when you have love for god you will have love for the topic that he has got which is prakriti or nature so our speaker for today has had a wonderful career in the field of sustainability and environment with uh, a great love for uh, ozone layer protection and uh, industrial development in particular he went on to serve as the director of vigyan prasar an autonomous organization of the department of science and technology government of india and is currently a professor in the ntpc school of business dealing with environment and sustainability so today we thought 
since he's already spoken we will go on a question and answer kind of a journey wherein uh, we will be leading to how that love for nature evolved through various stages of his association with sai and we will also try to understand how swami defines nature and the need to respect it and uh, is is respect something that we cultivate derive or practice and that is how the discussion is going to be probably he is hearing it for the first time as to what we are going to do uh, and i'm sure he's going to be bamboozled with whatever is going to come but then as we all know whatever we are doing it is him and i am very very happy to have gopi anna with us today uh, on this sai govin series for the second time sai ram anna and we will we will start this conversation as follows uh, i know that your journey has started off with balvikas and for someone who is very passionate about balvikas and the beauty in which swami has brought education first into the journey of spiritual transformation or just becoming a good individual or just the journey of understanding yourself can you try and highlight what were the main facets that attracted you or that got you going in this journey that has led you where it is balvikas and let's talk about pre seva dal subsequently over to you anna om shri sai ram what a joy it is uh, to connect with swami's devotees i know i am speaking in the presence of people who have had and who continue to have wonderful experiences of his divinity and therefore all that i wish to share with you is only to to kind of um, align our thoughts together uh, in a manner that we can express our gratitude to him now uh, venkat you know uh, no one gets a second opportunity to create the first impression as the murphy's law says Uh, you know but murphy loves me a lot he says always expect the unexpected uh, so you know you know and and this is a joyous thing to happen <laughs> great to to answer your question directly the larger fortune the larger fortune was to be part of the first batch of balvikas and why do i call it the larger fortune it means uh, we were not very large in number whenever swami would come to chennai uh, the small group of balvika children uh, would get chances to to, to take part in this car be with swami for a while i remember it, you know there is a road in chennai called eldams road eldams road at the end of eldams road there was a kalyan mandap where all balvika children were one morning asked to assemble i suppose we were hardly 50 60 of us swami gave us all pencil boxes i remember you know when you know took namaskar and then um, the larger blessing and i reinforce that i'm saying that for the second time is at that stage of life all that we know is the hand holding that the father and the mother do and when they tell us that here is swami the divine mind gets oriented to it seamlessly going to balvikas every sunday was something we really looked forward to it meant going away from the chaos You know, you know, even at that age, you know, stage, maybe you know, when you are all of, let's say, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine years. I I remember going going to Balvikas from the year nineteen sixty eight, sixty nine, when I was all of eight or nine years. You know, we look forward to the wonderful vibrations, um, and I'm probably using that for the first time ever in an expression of this nature. You know, we feel so happy and peaceful. and above all that secu- that feeling of security swami's families you know would would provide us with radha ban is here uh, you know i remember how you know i'm probably jumping you know, you know when i would go with jagdish to his home 
uh, his his father said, uh, "Let's do what is called the MGB campaign. May God bless you campaign." Rather when I do not know if you, you as the daughter of Rajan would have been, uh, you know, awake to that message of his. No, but then in, you know when we meet people who are so kind and spread the kindness. Uh, I will stop at this point and then we will take the discussion further. Balmikas meant everything pure, holy, recharging ourselves with the opportunity to really learn wonderful values at that point of time when the mind and the heart are most receptive. Wonderful. Um... I guess it's, it, I mean, you brought uh, memories of Eldam's Road. All I could think of was Abbotsbury. So later on, the Tamil Nadu Balvikas used to have that blessing of getting Swami come every Pongal and give us all kinds of prizes. So the pencil box, no different. I remember getting a watch uh, as, uh, as, as one of those trinkets that come as uh, Balvikas. And I think the Balvikas movement of Tamil Nadu, even today, they are spearheading the digital movement of Balvikas all over the world. Uh, the, the material that is getting prepared is amazing. And uh, gratitude to all those Mahanubhavas who took Swami's message of uh, uh, allowing young minds to blossom so early. Uh, in the right direction. Uh, having said that, I also know that we had this interesting concept of uh, post uh, group one, group two. We had this journey at a very interesting phase of teenage uh, called pre -Sevadal. And the word itself is, uh, and later on pre had a bit of seva or guru or teaching, you know, like you have the option to go either uh, service oriented or the education oriented uh, thing. Can you share Maybe any interesting experience of, you know, where the transformation happens from making God uh, bless you or happy, whatever that that uh, Uncle Rajan was uh, doing to all of you. How did it move to that, uh, uh, I would say, uh, questioning age of teenage where you suddenly go from being instructed to adapting in a pre -save. Maybe can you dwell a little bit on I'll that? I'll be most happy to answer this question. And, and thank you for either deliberately or inadvertently bumping into this questioning and acceptance dynamics. Before I go further, let me demonstrate a value that Balvikas taught us. My family is here with me uh, and my wife Vijaya joins me you know, in, you know, in conveying Sairam to all of you. <laughs> this inclusiveness, inclusiveness, you know, to say that I am here in the presence of people who are as eminent, as wonderful as anybody else. And to acknowledge that presence is something uh, you know, unique. And we imbibe these values when we watch people like our Balvikas Guru, for instance. Let me take this chance to, to offer my salutations to Prema Jairaman. And, you know, she was our, our, our Balvikas Guru. Subsequently, my mother also became a Balvikas Guru. I, you know, I, Saturdays used to be Mahila Vibhag uh, bhajan sessions. You know, and Sunday was, was the Balvikas one. You know? uh, if I'm right, uh, Mondays used to be the Samiti bhajans. So Papa used to go for, to Monday and then the Wednesday, or, yeah, you know, if I'm right, was Vishnu Sanamam sessions. You know, in the same Mandali in Tinagar. So Papa, we you know almost, every, you know, and on Tuesday, uh, remember I proposed the name of Vasudeva, you know, one of those Shankaracharyas. Uh, we, you, know, we, you know, in his home in Motidal Street, we used to have bhajans. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at home, Friday probably something, then Saturday Mahila Vibhag, Sunday Balvikas. And why Mahila Vibhag for me? At times I used to accompany my mother, you know, but very often she would go with another devotee and come back. So. The larger point is that seamless, everyday, uh, you know, activity centered on, on Swami's um, devotion. As far to Balvikas, there was, there was another interesting occasion, and I'm sure people here also, you know, many of us would have been through the same Balvikas, you know, in several parts of the world. And especially when it came to Chennai, when Swami would visit Abhatsbury, you know, children used to, Balvikas kids were invited to the home of the state president. 
which was a huge bungalow of those days. You know, and crafts sessions would happen. We actually would construct the, let's say, the Rama's chariot, the idols of monkeys, you know, with, with paper, with, the, you know, bamboos and all kinds of contractions and organize an exhibition for Swami when he would come. I remember standing there in one of those Rama installs saying, when Sri Rama went to Lanka to bring his wife back to India, you know, to, to Bharat, you know, we, we were, uh, you know, given the scripts and we used to uh, you know, kind of uh, internalize them and present them to Swami. Uh, so Swami visiting these exhibitions was another interesting opportunity for us. A third one was, I remember around Swami's 50th birthday, uh, you know that the year, in the year was 75, I moved into Palpika in Prisavadal around 77, 78, if I'm right. So as Swami's 50th birthday, I, I remember mentioning this earlier, when, when kids assemble from all over the country in uh, Prashantinatayam, they were all taken to the Anantapur hostel by bus for the night. And after we reached there, we were served food. We would get up in the morning, have a bath, get into the bus and come back to Prashantinath. This is how it was during Swami's 50th birthday. And even things like uh, a dance opportunity. I remember doing the Kavadi dance in front of Swami. Uh, when, you know, on the, when, in the you know, Chandra state. Now, why am I saying this? These were all moments of proximity, physical proximity to Swami. And then Swami, of course, would come to you know, Chennai in those days, I would Imagine it was almost once or at times even twice a year. Um, the whole family would, would then rush to Swami's Darshan, you know, then come back late in the evening and again go back to Darshan, right from that and time and so on. Now, the while that emotional security and gravitating towards that, uh, you know, one another typical aspect is also enjoying the, the, the inclusiveness of the Satya Sai family, the family of Swami's devotees. What an amazing thing it was. You know, I, I remember at times uh, when I, you know, uh, I've actually been taken to the house of another devotee where, you know, the mother of that home would cook food for all of us, you know, would have food, but then we never felt we were at another place. You know how it is to enter the house of a fellow devotee. It is at those moments of time we pick values of, you know, saying that we are all one family and when we go out to serve, for instance, in our home, the mom used to cook food in huge vessels. Uh, we would pack them and Papa used to, you know, in a cycle, keep my brother in the front on the bar and the cycle and I at the back. You know, we would carry food and do anadana mondo, you know, on the streets. Yeah. You know, the, the larger point, therefore, is that completely imbibing the spirit that Swami is the ultimate. And Balvikas as an opportunity to learn that Swami wishes to infuse in us was the most wonderful. If I would now, at this age of life, use the word healing opportunity. The healing opportunity. You know, you go to the school, you know, at that age, you meet all kinds of people, you know, even at those stages of life, there are all kinds of rumblings, ramblings and whatnot. You know. So we look forward to going to the Balvikas. And I think that was that was the most beautiful part of the Balvikas stuff. Now, uh, uh, can I can I take a moment more as we progress? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I have no doubts in saying that all Balvikas, Pri Sevadal, Sevadal and even Swami students, if any, or for that matter, Swami's devotees in this group will be able to, I pray, resonate with what I'm saying. You know, uh, we know that we are in His folds is, is something unique and the greatest blessing we could enjoy. Now comes this larger question. Uh, Venkat and my dear brothers and sisters, when I look back, based on the question which you asked me, India is the only country in the world that asks her citizens to understand and practice scientific temper. It's part of India's constitution, Article 51 AH. 
No other country asks her citizens to do this. Now, if I were to look back based on this constitutional agenda, what was probably placed before us was even through our Balvikas and our pre civil classes, and I will elaborate a bit on the pre civil classes a little later, how, how wonderful they were. You know, in Balvikas, yes, you know, the teacher said something, you know, we, we tried to understand, but we sang bhajans, you know, we, you know, and then came back. But in pre civil as you rightly said, when the mind was maturing a bit, you know, we were, we were trying to understand the precepts, the concepts, uh, incidentally, those days, uh, there, was, there was only one examination I you know, remember doing. Uh, you know, the, the level of complexity was much lesser, if I can tell you that. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, I remember taking that exam also. Uh, and then, well, what I wanted to say was the open-endedness of one's mind is what scientific temper is about. And that means to say that, look, what I'm experiencing at this point of time is one more facet, one more facet, and it is not necessarily contrary to the other facets of life. One more facet, and that is the open-endedness, the open-endedness, uh, which is true even of, even let's say, you know, take the case of COVID. What was our understanding of COVID, the infection, the infestation dynamics at the time it started, and where are we today when we know about resistance and what can happen in so far as our unpreparedness? Therefore, when the mind is receptive to these cases, that what we know today is at best transient. And there are newer frontiers of science. And if I can replace the word science with newer, newer uh, and more mature thinking of values in life. It is that open-endedness, you know, that Swami provides. And that takes me to something with, about which I'll stop and then we can get into the next discussion. Even, you know, when we have to be in Swami's presence and uh, fortunately in my 10 years, I would have gone home for hardly a month or two put together. You know, uh, we see Swami uh, at times getting really angry and at other times, uh, you know, uh, a loving beyond measure. Now, how do we uh, absorb these? And it is possible to absorb these when we say these are different facets and we get to experience them depending on the time and the space, if I can sound a bit scientific, correlates, if I can say the time and the space junctions in that. Fantastic. No, I mean, uh, it, uh, there's so much you uh, like names you bring up, I can bring up uh, Amina Auntie, who was uh, the Balvikas convener during uh, my period later on uh, in the 80s. Uh, the trips we used to make staying in Andhra Mahila Sabha and then going to Abbotsbury for Darshan and all the prizes brings a lot of nostalgia. And I think Pre Sevadal was one of the best uh, uh, curated programs, which was experiential. And I think Swami brought that experiential aspect of learning, gave us the responsibility to let the mind question and understand rather than being taught. A beautiful way, I, I, at least when we did pre Sevadal, we had to do a project. So we had to either take it as teaching or we had to take a Seva project. And most of it was uh, wonderful experiences in that uh, phase of our lives. And uh, very nice to hear from you on this aspect. Now, let me move on to this thing. Now, uh, all of us, start this journey where we are in awe, we, we are told Swami is divine, Swami is God. Uh, perceptions are different for different people when we first come to meet him. Some of us get conditioned before we get closer to him, if you want to put it that way. Then you start becoming a student. So he's on one hand, your vice chancellor, if, if the university existed then, uh, or, and he's God on one angle. Uh, sometimes he's your friend, multiple facets of Swami, and most often a, a loving and caring mother and uh, a reprimanding father when he has to take that role of uh, doing his way of giving you the treatment. Now, uh, in this uh, 10 years that you've had, where I know that you've moved from your undergraduate degree to master's to the first batch of PhD, 
can you try and explain how you were able to understand or sometimes when the discussions are very casual we don't feel that divinity is then right you need that distance to understand it was it something that you experienced in awe while you were as a student or was it something that you felt when the distance came or is it something that you feel now in gratitude of the journey that has been so if you can give me this multiple dimensions to the facets of swami to the experience that you would have had then to the time you left to how you feel now when you know you love to go back look at a photograph i'm sure you will look at all your photographs that you have holding that that uh, that uh, beautiful institute uh, flag institute, institute flag or getting that degree or that beautiful moment when you get that padana namaskar and collect your degree certificate which most boys have an extra privilege compared to the anandpur campus and so on and so forth uh, can you give me that can you go through that side of it before we dwell on the larger topic that i would like to talk about Beautiful. Um, you will recall my saying that i'll deliberate a bit on the pre seva the experience before i go into this yeah uh, while that for balvikas was all if i can use a word chocolatey you know uh and you know it just sprung in my head i'm using that it, you know by the time you come to bhavan you know in a pre seva the uh, things like seva get on to the agenda and what does this mean uh, participating in camps number 2 going to the house of then state president mr achutanandam uh, probably you know, you know a place like tinagar and raipuram were like two planets you know those days in you know, we had to take the electric train go a long way and that's where rather than jagdish and we used to take the train and go um, and what was the seva there we had to um, apply glue to the wrappers of sanatan sarthi uh, you, know, you know there was a car shed and the entire car shed a huge one you know was full of sanatan sarthi this is spread it on the floor and apply the glue and what not and after we finished that then you know that probably be some uh, you know other shramdan as they would say you know and then uh, all of this was was uh, should i say uh, not only inspiring it also created a sense of belonging to the surroundings you know that we are part of the larger mosaic a part of the larger mosaic of the society and at that point of time around 17 or 18 when something amazing happens and what is happen, what happens uh, when swami comes to chennai uh, you also get to look at swami students uh, if i'm right around 78 or 79 was uh, was almost the first or second time when swami students started accompanying I I really wouldn't know much prior to that because as a Balbikar kid we would have been running around there, you know. So when uh, you know in 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 seventy nine I remember uh, when Swami brought Swami students along with him uh, and Ram Prasad the president you know Chakravarti Garu's son in fact spoke in um, in Pune Chandra. Oh my, you know uh, um, the 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 uh, the vehemence a positive vehemence. the content authority and delivery they're all so inspiring so inspiring and when you watch these people they also say are swami you know like it be great if i were also your student so that you know that thought gets into the mind and what do parents say it's all entirely in swami's hands don't worry then comes the time for the pre seva the winter course winter course this is preceding the summer course uh, we went participated uh, you know jagdish myself and there are few others also spoken here <clears throat> you know there is one girida so from chennai who used to sing in swami's presence uh, you know we all went and because we never missed any pre seva the class and that amounts in you know brings in that sense of discipline you know not to miss class be on time you know uh, we landed in vrindavan with the hope of getting into the summer course we were not assured but 
we were uh, kind of uh, confident and happy that if you look at our attendance, our participation, and whatnot, you know, it's been uh, almost complete. And what does Mr. Chitanandam do? He comes with a whole lot of summer course um, you know, uh, tags in his hand and he calls us and hands over. He says, okay, you go, you go. Oh, my. So we got into the summer course. Now comes the answer to your question. During the summer course, when we look at Swami at the proximity, I remember, I distinctly remember, one of the first thoughts that came into my head was, oh, my Swami, you are the same Swami we offer Arti at home. You are the same Swami we worship as God. And you are here right in front. And that too with, you know, that, that level of proximity as Swami is Oh my, you know, uh, it you know, took me quite a while, quite a while, you know, to, 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 I will not use the word overawed because it was after all our Swami, you know, but then the joy of it, the joy of it was humongous. Now, having got into the summer tours and then subsequently into Swami's college, the year was 79, the year was 1979. So 79 to 89 was, was, was one of the greatest decades of my life. Um, yeah. Now, Swami, in fact, um, asked one evening, what is devotion? What is devotion? Oh, no, no, what is bhakti? Swami asked, what is bhakti? I remember putting my hand up and saying, Swami, devotion. Swami said, no, I'm not asking you for translation. I'm asking you for the meaning. And that was a momentous occasion. When Swami said, the meaning of bhakti is love for God and not fear of God. Truly transformational, truly transformational. So that, in essence, answers your questions about how do we look at Swami. When Swami therefore says, it's love for Swami, um, we said, Swami, great, you know, like, thank you, <laughs> you know, for that wonderful wisdom, eye opener. And therefore, there are zero barriers with Swami. Zero barriers with Swami. We hear from our own colleagues, and during discourses and when others speak about Swami's divinity, Swami's omniscience, omnipresence, and when that fear, the even, the, even a small iota of fear goes away, the joy of looking at Swami with whom you're very, very close, with no barriers, is again, is, is, uh, is phenomenal. I'm sure every one of us present here have our own experiences of, of, of uh, Swami's divinity. And that, in fact, is centered on this fearlessness, fearlessness. And this fearlessness, in fact, takes you, um, you know, if I can say, gives also the joy of experiencing whatever Swami says. I must dare now say with a lot of equanimity, you know, you know like, Yes, you know, you know, you know, I know, you know, uh, I imagine my mom is also listening. I would know, you know, my mom is at home. Uh, you know, uh, you know, what if my mom bangs me? You know, that's perfectly fine. You know, uh, what if my family bangs me? That's perfectly fine. You know, and then we go back, Are Swami, please. No, Swami, please. All that I remember now is saying, Swami, please. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not saying it just like that. You know, this is all that we would say, Swami, please, Swami. You know, and that is the beginning and the end of the story, if I can say. You know? Absolute fearlessness and seamlessness. We, are, we can get further into the discussion. Well, uh, you, you know, uh, I was actually, you know, uh, when, when I was trying to correlate what should be our discussion for today uh, with the brief conversation that we had, and uh, now hearing this timelines that you said, I'm having my own goosebumps. I don't know if you can remember this, but the next topic that I want to go and speak to you about, uh, considering all the work that you have done in sustainability and the environment is Prakriti. And 
i i am not a very avid reader i read when i need to refer otherwise i'm happy listening and when i googled and the first thing that i landed up on swami on prakriti was from may 1979 summer course at brindavan and swami says just as just as water is needed to make a pot out of dry mud the combination of shiva and shakti is necessary for the creation to come into being and swami goes on to talk about purusha which is the masculine entity which is imperishable and permanent and prakriti as the feminine entity which is perishable and impermanent but it is uh, although the the divinity of the cosmic witness is what is the eternal reality prakriti is more a motherly connotation that swami gives in this whole talk now i want to understand whether that had any impact how did you move towards this love for uh, nature environment and how would you bring in the values that you have learnt over balvikas over your education at the satya sai institute towards what you now have as a career which is not just about teaching but it is to try and apply uh, where there is this challenge for growth there is this challenge for development and there is this importance that all of us need to give towards mother nature so it's a very big topic i don't want to interrupt with questions i'll wait to see what you have to say but uh, it's a pertinent point that all all of us should pay heed because we hear of rising temperatures we hear of unusual weather patterns uh, we also have this attitude sometimes it does not matter when i am alive nothing is going to happen it's going to be for future generations which but but if we fail to respect mother in any form then it's going to be an end some day so how do we change this with uh, the values that uh, swami has taught us uh, or rather what would be your take I, let, let let me not throw more points i'm trying to kind of put in a thought and trying to force that uh, conversation in that manner instead let me hear uh which is going to be uh, the abundance of experience i think you have worked at the un level you are working in a country where all of us when we are in a development mode we have this conflict between development and sustainability and then we also have these human values that are ingrained in us which comes into force when when devastation manifests and gives us warning after warning so in this time let's let's look at this topic from the sai perspective Let's, let's uh, lovely, Vankar. Uh, you know, in fact, since you are making an interaction, can I take the liberty of asking you to invite few other brothers and sisters to also get into the deliberation? Yeah. That will be a great thing to happen. So, so I, I, I leave it open now. So I'm going to uh, move myself out of spotlight because I want only Anna on the screen. So, if any one of you have questions, there are two ways. You can kindly unmute yourself. and turn on the video if you are in a position to do so ask those questions because at the end of the day uh, we are trying to find a way how we can do our little bit towards uh, the mother the loka mata the bhu mata you know the three the, the three different matas that swami refers to of mother nature itself uh, so be free and uh, ask your questions so i i'm done with my questioning to be honest uh this is all that i wanted to lead up to i've done my role so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions as uh, we move along yes anna it's all yours yeah more than asking questions you know we would love to share i'm sure everyone has deep insights you know we'll be able to that's that's yeah. one of the things swami always insisted you know inclusiveness inclusiveness yeah. which was absolutely sure anna i leave it open you have the liberty to to take it forward so i i i'll do my part of getting out of this screen and having you hello that's a <laughs> uh, great um, one of the values that swami had always taught was gratitude to my mind that is the greatest of human values gratitude to parents gratitude to the family gratitude to all of swami's family for that matter with equal importance 
and to our country enough uh, without getting poetic about it. Uh, Swami would also say when you refer to this Mata aspect, you know, uh, about which you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too very, uh, you know, uh, what should I say? Uh, yes, you know, looking at Swami as a mother was one thing, but then looking at Swami as as the divine beyond that was also, you know, one another perspective, you know, which which I was I was following. Yeah. Now Swami would say in this context, if you do not listen to your own parents, your mother, Swami would often say mother. If you're not going to listen to your mother or your father, how will I be confident that you're going to listen to me? No, this, you know, this was something critical. This was absolutely important as, as a message uh, which, which drills the values of obedience. And I dare use the word gratitude as we progress further. Now, uh, let me align what you're saying with what happened at the Institute at a couple of uh, important junctures. And what were these junctures? When the master's program at the university, at, at Swami's Institute was launched, uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences, you know, there were two streams of specialization. One is uh, applied habitat ecology understanding ecosystems. Uh, can you imagine, uh, you know, when I went looking for literature on modeling around the year, to be precise, in 1984, there were hardly one or two publications, ecosystem modeling and so on. Now, I don't intend converting this into an ecology discussion, you know, but then oriented to what Swami kind of enabled. You know? And therefore, at the Institute, when we, uh, commenced our work. That was probably one of the roots, one of the roots. You know, when we were, you know, we had a wonderful devotee professor, Professor C. L. Mahajan, who, you know, came from Jaipur, uh, a very old devotee of Swami. He was a professor. And he therefore kind of uh, tweaked, if I can say, uh, um, our minds to understanding ecology. And when the second opportunity was when the research facilities were being set up at the institute. I can tell you the year was, uh, and, and there's no ego in this eye. This is so much to say that the institute was always at the frontiers. I remember the Department of Physics working on lasers, uh, you know, and on synthetic organic chemistry in the Department of Chemistry. Mathematics, in fact, my colleagues went into mathematical modeling. And in fact, one of one of the theses was on modeling a tree canopy, tree canopy, you know, in the Department of Mathematics. And the year was 1984. It was 1984. Now, coming back to the Department of Biological Sciences, one of the most amazing photomicrography, as it's called, photomicrography facilities were set up in the department. Swami visited the photomicrography facility, looked through the microscopes, looking at the microorganisms. Swami has been there in the department, going around the department, you know. Uh, and when, I, you know, my area of work, uh, you know, I had the three other colleagues, they took up nutritional studies. Um, I went into microbial ecology and so on. Now, why am I saying this? This is so much to say that the institute and the institutional facilities there helped us look at probably some of the frontier frontier manifestations of environmental dynamics. I also remember Swami taking note of the fact that um, you know, we were working on these areas. Swami knew us by also the areas we were working on, on environmental studies. It was absolutely clear. Uh, you know, as, as I had the chance of explaining sometime when we went to Kodai, you know, I was fortunate to be part of the first batch when Swami inaugurated the Kodai Mandir in, in Kodai Pangu. Uh, you know, the year was 1986. Uh, Swami uh, pushed, if I can use the, with an inverted commas, like what happened today, you know, pushed us to speak on, 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 um, on frontier areas. Uh, and I happened to speak on environment. And therefore, speaking about these and 
of course, hearing from Swami. And what was so wonderful about it, Swami, of course, you know, also showing us, uh, we, you know, how he can materialize himself, materialize objects, show himself everywhere, and in fact, even interpret environmental phenomena. We were all witness to all of this, witness to all of this. And this, this in fact, where we, you know, where we you know, laid the foundational, foundational, if I can say the foundation stones. So to be very precise, the institution, the Satisai Institute picked up environmental studies as an important thing. To also say that it was entirely his grace and I, exp and I expressed my gratitude to him, to the Swami on this. When I landed for my postdoctoral research, and let me share that experience uh, you know, with you, uh, with, you know, with all of us. And that was, that was an amazing way of, you know, Swami, I imagine you would love what I'm going to say. I landed in the hands of, and let me take this chance to express my gratitude to that person also, Professor T. N. Anantakrishnan. Professor T. N. Anantakrishnan. T. N. Anantakrishnan was part of the committee that saved the Silent Valley, along with Professor M. G. K. Benny. Uh, he is probably amongst the number one of number ones in the world in the area of chemical ecology, as it's called. Don't be so worried about it. And now comes Swami's hand, which is important. Uh, when I joined his lab, he asked me, do you know entomology? I said, I just know the letter E of entomology, so I do not know anything beyond that. He, uh, of course, looked at uh, you know, my coming from Swami's Institute and a few abilities and research. He said, don't worry, join me. That was another truly transformational, and I'm using the word transformation for the second time, a great experience. Whatever that was, uh, if time permits, what was the transformation and how we can discuss later. But then now, what was Swami's, um, Swami's hand? One fine day, within a couple of months, the professor tells me, uh, you're from Prashant Nilayam, you're Swami's student, right? Um, I want to show you something today when you come home. I want you to come home. Uh, that was uh, around the time I also did, uh, when I got married. Me and my wife go to the professor's house. And what does professor do when we go to his house? He, um, he opens the altar. And in the altar is Swami's picture. Okay, he says, you know, I am also Swami's devotee man. And you are Swami's student. Good, work with me. Swami always, in addition to gratitude, in addition to the open-endedness, you know, as I said, the open-minded approach that Swami helped us with. And therefore, there were no dilemmas at all. There were no dilemmas. One guiding principle, acknowledge newer frontiers. And the greater lesson, what we know today is only a very small fraction of all that has to be known. This is absolute science. I give you the reference to COVID. Uh, our, our own understanding of our large environmental systems, national, local, regional, global levels, is all changing. And if I can use the word evolving over a period of time. And I can assure you, some of the greatest scientists are the most humble people. The word science is derived from the root word scientia. Knowledge, pursuit of knowledge, to know. The root word for Veda is Vid. Vid means to know, pursuit of knowledge. So these are two different language expressions of the same pursuit of excellence. And so that was Swami's hand. When Swami therefore said, look, I'm here and Amitakrishan is also my devotee. I'm protecting you. Don't worry. And that meant also that I abide entirely by all the values that Swami said. And what is the second value? In addition to gratitude, I've got the courage to say that it's, it is blistering levels of hard work. Blistering levels of hard work. Okay, blistering. Uh, amazing, amazing. Uh, you, know, you know, and when you work with a professor of that nature, uh, you are asked to review what is happening at the global level. Identify newer areas of work. And therefore, that value of that value of hard work and that value of gratitude continue. 
Uh, can I give a science example here? Uh, Go ahead, Anna. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. I, I again imagine you will all love this example. You know, uh, coming from the field of entomology, chemical ecology, it's about how insects and plants interact with each other. Venkat and my dear brothers and sisters, very often, I'm not speaking about this group, uh, in groups where ego levels are very high. And I repeat, not as part of this group, where ego levels are very high. We think we are super intelligent. Uh, within, about, um, within about six months of my work at the Institute when I was reviewing literature, I came across a classic example of how insects are profoundly intelligent. You will love the story over the next one minute. Here is a female insect which does not want to harm the leaf on which it wants to lay its eggs. Normally, the insect scraps the surface of the leaf or adheres the insect to the eggs, the leaf surface and so on. It's got its own mechanisms. But in this process, it also injures the leaf. Now, what does this specific insect do? It waits for the stomata to open when the leaf is breathing. And when the stomata open, it drops its eggs inside. Isn't this super intelligence? Where are we? To what extent have we understood our systems? This was in the Journal of Environmental Entomology. I remember referring this to the group when I made my presentation. And Professor was, was super delighted. What are we speaking of insofar as our intelligence is concerned? In fact, our mind only looks for proxy indicators of what is happening. We ourselves are far removed from the center of action. We look at indicators, we look at others, correlate them and derive indicators of change. Derive understanding of indicators of change. And that takes me to the lesson which Swami would always say, humility is the third lesson. When we look at nature, all that we have to do is to be humble. We learn newer lessons. I even said it is a journal of environmental entomology. Therefore, working on these cutting edges of science with the people who stood for excellence. You can imagine the combination of our number one scientist in the world also being Swami's devotee and who's awfully humble and has this handprint. You know, we don't use the word footprint anymore. Footprint is an impact. Handprint is the outcome of good action. This handprint on, on, on policy at the national and the global levels. So what could have been that person? And I take this opportunity to express my gratitude to him who was also merged with nature. And that gratitude also goes to every one of you for giving me this chance to also speak about, about what Swami has said and, and to everyone I'm connected with. So much for science, and there are a couple of other interesting aspects, if you can go ahead. Thank you. Yes, Anna. It's gone. You're already setting the boundary of where we think our intelligence is greater than we find uh, something like, you know, a simple act of ahimsa in that little insect trying to do what it has to do with nature, but ensures that no harm is done in that process. A brilliant lesson. I'm sure we're going to use this. Uh, it needs to be illustrated for Balvika's children to know. Always you can learn from uh, the tiniest of uh, the things, uh, profound lessons. Go on, Anna. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you're going to convey this lesson, you know, again, Journal of Environmental Entomology, 1991-92, somewhere. If you bring those 12 volumes to me in a few minutes, I can show you that reference. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about. So, yeah. You know, you know and this, 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 uh, this preparedness to work very hard. Preparedness to work very hard. And uh, I remember using the word blistering hard work. It's like, you know, professor says, um, um, take these 25 papers in the evening today and tomorrow morning, come back with a review of these 25 papers. 
uh, and this this number twenty five would continue for the whole period of six months to eight months. You know, so <laughs> you know that then keys the person you know into things like uh, when there are opportunities calling, don't lose them. When there are new avenues, catch up with them. And that, in fact, uh, took me to, you know, again with Swami's grace, work in areas of direct relevance to the humanity at large. And at that, use this uh, ozone layer protection, ultraviolet radiation, um, integrity of life forms, and therefore protection of life on Earth. People who work on these areas, sorry, after you. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Therefore, the, 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 the four most important lessons we learned from Swami, as I said, is gratitude, extreme hard work, love for Swami, and, and open endedness, and open endedness. Swami probably would not have referred to, you know, in his discourses to the word scientific temper. Or Article 51 AH. He did not have to. You know, he is a personification of it. But then later in life, when you get an opportunity to know such things are there, we say, Swami, thank you, Swami. You have prepared us for it all. Open-endedness, I think that is what is needed, right? So when you are open-ended to have multiple uh, ideas, that's when conflict can be resolved because otherwise you tend to uh, and stubborn and go with what you think is right or wrong. But uh, despite so many lessons that we get from nature, I mean, you are having flooding almost every year in, uh, in, in Chennai when there were no rains and people had to pray and do all yajnas for rains to happen. Do you have rains everywhere? We are having diseases which spread beyond, uh, beyond control, such as what we have seen. Uh, how do we heal ourselves? or heal our relationship with nature. I mean, it, it has to start somewhere. And what do you think would be the primary thing? Uh, if there is enough awareness that has happened. I'm not saying awareness is not there, but then that open-endedness that you said, right? Even with awareness, we, we tend to, you know, throw caution to wind and uh, take as if tomorrow is not there at all. So how do we develop this love uh, to, to, accept that there is a problem and start somewhere small. What do you think is, is what you would give as a message on that aspect? Let me build on this word handprint, which I think uh, we, you know, is the essence of it all. Handprint is about remedial action. There is one institution called the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. It's called the IUCN. International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. It's been around for several decades. I bumped into it for the first time in the early 90s. Early 90s means uh, around 35 years ago. I bumped into a publication which again transformed me. And then you open, sometimes you see a punch line, you know, a single line in one of those pages, you know, opening pages. And what did it say? People who receive information retain the right to never translate that learning into action. This meant we could create any level of awareness. But then there's a larger question. Are we aware enough? This means even if a very large segment of, let's say, the less aware people do not engage in handprint action, the positive aspect of all of this is a collective group of people who have the responsibility to protect nations, to protect civilization, if I can dare use the word. You know, institutions like the the United Nations Environment Program, or let's say uh, the coming together of nations in various bilateral, multilateral forums, 
deliberate on actions that should be taken. And the chorus for that kind of an action has grown enormously. Let me give a typical example. Nowadays, we don't really hear of people who have perished on account of storms. Take the case of Odisha or, 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 or you know, for that matter, any coastal area. The National Disaster Management Authority swings into action in India. And the number of people who actually perish are in single digits today. And that could be because of probably lack of access. No? So we, we don't get those huge, humongous numbers anymore. This is one small indicator of how a lot of remedial action is catching up. But when science and scientific evidences grow, the hesitation to get into action is much, much lesser. There are clear scientific evidences about which a lot of sensitization happens to world leaders. And therefore, we now see how uh, almost everyone, everyone across all geographies really speak of things like climate change, ozone depletion, pollution, and things like that. You know, we were far too removed from all of those, but at least we have started speaking about those. Having said that, I repeat what I said a few moments ago, where action really has to take place, decision making has to take place, the spread and depth of action is increasingly profound. So I won't lose hope on any of this. And, 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 and uh, from, the, from a human value perspective, what is it? Uh, is it just having love? Sometimes we can have love, but we need not display it in action. Uh, you know, see, we are all taught to have human values, but translating human values into action is what you were talking about. You can have awareness, you can have knowledge, but then how do you translate? What are the baby steps that we could do? Uh, not just respect. Let's say we can say, I respect my mother, I respect my wife, I respect women. But, you know, how do you show it in action in in little ways possible through practicing human values? How can we reduce the harm inflicted on nature by values in action in, in, from that perspective? Um, I'm, um, I, I will not err on this on the side of proselytization, not at all. Because I know, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we are all together as wonderful devotees of Swami, you know, and therefore, as I said, I will not proselytize, which means, you know, uh, say anything uh, or preach. <laughs> uh, where, you know, I understood the importance of what you're saying. Okay. Thank you, Bhagat. That is excellent. Uh, as a devotee okay. and as a student who has been in Swami's presence, um, I am sorry, there is no ego in this eye. But one thing which we practice is what Swami has, um, if I can say, uh, uh, you know, drilled positively into our minds and hearts. And what is it? Swami would say, I am always with you, in you, around you, watching you. There are any number of experiences of students and devotees when Swami would say, hey, you did this, I watched you. I know what you're doing. You know, when that, 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 that conviction goes into the heart, honestly, Venkat and my dear brothers and sisters, um, I dare say, you know, we wouldn't really harm certainly won't ever harm. And this, this, this also is a, an expression of our gratitude to Swami, saying that Swami, you are, you are everywhere. Yeah. But then probably from a low kick, if I can, you know, as devotees to understand what we mean, you know, somebody were to unmindful of, you know, whoever it is, you know, were to push us beyond a certain extreme. You know? You know, then it becomes a bit difficult. Yeah, but I can, with absolute conviction, say, we, as Swami's devotees and we have known Swami, will not be the prime mover in causing a harm. Yeah, I, I agree. But, but I, I also want to say, uh, you know, being 
you know, uh, at least for me, um, when you look at environment, saving energy, conserving energy, and so on and so forth, definitely the satsangs where many of people have reminded, I think Kantarao sir is there, few others have also mentioned how Swami would go to the extent of ensuring the switches, the light is switched off immediately as you leave the room. There's not a little, you know, I set it by example. So although sometimes with economic comforts, we don't realize the value of harm that we do unintentionally. It is like, uh, you know, the, the statement of that insect, the insect uh, by being in the moment was consciously trying to avoid harm. I mean, how do you stay consciously aware in your action is what Swami uh, beautifully represented by just doing simple things, switching off the electricity, no matter what. When lights are off, he will conserve energy. He taught it by example. I just wanted to understand how uh, you, from a scientific mind, where all we are understand. I mean, you are able to comprehend saying that awareness is building uh, damage to be inflicted in terms of harm. But I was trying to see how. Uh, the love for nature can naturally happen because awareness for nature, to appreciate nature, happens when you still the mind. See, when you are able to still the mind, you are able to see what is beautiful. Otherwise, you can have two headphones on and walk where you don't have to hear the birds, you don't have to hear the sound of anything, and you have music uh, jarring on, on your uh, earphones, right? How do you be in that state of awareness to realize that that too is living with you? That, I mean, it, it sounds very profound, but it is easier to tell a small ch child and it follows. But I think as we grow older, that awareness kind of drops. And how do we develop that, that love, intent love where no harm unintentionally will not even happen? I, I just want to know if there is a way because uh, this has to manifest in today's fast changing world. I mean, you look at the number of consumeristic things that we have. We look at recycled I mean, we talk about recycle, we talk about reduce, we talk about so many things, but what is that biggest value uh, apart from gratitude that you have? Gratitude is when you realize what you have. Most of us tend to develop it at a later stage in our life. But how do I look at the present to keep that continuous awareness to the fact that without nature, I can't exist and I am responsible with my actions for, its, for it being around with me? I mean, that is what I was trying to get more to see whether this message can go down to us who actually go into a state of ignorance when progress happens in life to seeing how it can be deep rooted at a young mind. In your case, that happened with that gratitude building, which happened with Balvikas, which happened with Sevadal, which happened by staying in Swami, uh, it, which happened by virtue of the subjects you studied and the uh, impact it had on what you study. So you have had a continuous impact that there is a passion to it, which is also a subject that you are in. For us, it is an add-on. Great. I'll be very happy to answer this, you know, this question. Uh, as always, uh, before we go further, uh, if Kantarao spoke about Swami switching off the lights, uh, I can, I can uh, place another interesting uh, you know, experience before you. Um, they've seen myself, and there was, there was another brother by name Malikeshwaran. Uh, I have zero hesitation in mentioning these names because we are all Sai brothers who have been in Swami's presence. We were once um, called by uh, Swami to go upstairs. He had just returned from Vrindavan and there were sacks of letters. Swami called us up and made us sit in front of him uh, from, from afternoon 2.30 for about three to four days, for a couple of hours every day, for about four days, uh, before he would go down for darshan. We would sit in front of him and he would open, you know, we would open the sacks, open the letter and tap the envelope and along with the envelope, place the letter in front of him. Okay, we were sitting on the floor in uh, just a small room. Can you imagine just about, uh, not even 10 feet, 10 feet by four feet. Four, literally 10 feet by four feet. And can you imagine where was Swami sitting? On a bench. Swami was sitting on the bench upstairs. Yeah. Um, so that is that is so much for, for the simplicity. Yeah, so much for simplicity. And, and then what did Swami, you know, you know Swami? Yeah, 
Uh, another facet of Swami was his immense, immense kindness. Immense kindness. He knew we would err. And when some of us would, you know, when Swami would ask, you, stay on with Swami, what are you going to do? And I remember several of us saying, Swami will stay here. It's not as if he didn't know our future, you know, and where and what are we going to do and things like this. But then, you know, one takeaway from, from Swami was, was that absolute kindness, absolute kindness, you know, whoever and whatever, which is why probably Swami would say, past is past, forget the past. I think this is, this is yet another greatest human value, the greatest human value one can, one can, one can imbibe and practice. Uh, what rights have we got to stand judgment on each other? You know, what rights do we have? The greatest service we can do to Swami is to, in fact, tell people we meet in our lives that within our capacities being as it may, to say, please, pardon me, number one, and number two, the past is past in your case, and let me do everything to bring you back, rise, and to give that confidence like Swami would give for us. How many occasions have my colleagues and me not gone and caught his feet and said, Swami, please pardon me. You know, I, uh, get, you know, I will, I will not, uh, you know, get into my own, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, get into uh, my story of it, you know, when we finally, uh, you know, got a solid banging from Swami and whatnot, you know, and then Swami would, you know, I've personally experienced it a lot, you know, and then at the end of it, Swami would say, oh, it's all right, you know, and then, uh, you know, when I was leaving in 1989, Swami sent word saying that, say, tell him that I will all, now why am I saying that? It is to demonstrate the fact that Swami's absolute kindness and infinite grace, Swami is saying that wherever, however, under any circumstance, Swami will be with the person. Okay? So that is, that is another takeaway. And that takes me to this, this aspect of our understanding those values in so far as nature is concerned. Venkat, you, you, uh, you said uh, I had the opportunity of being within the system and therefore let us say, you know, that, that orientation was therefore um, implicit and built into. But then the entire world you know, has an uh, ecologist view from two points of view. One is called the anthropocentric view, saying that I am the center of the universe Everything in this nature is meant for me to exploit. Okay. It's called the anthropocentric view. And there is a nature-centric view, which is another worldview. And therefore, these worldviews are always persistent, which is why we have got people, challenge me if I'm wrong, a large number of people, large number of communities, which almost practice altruism when it comes to nature. They would say, we are part of nature, we will do everything to preserve nature. In fact, the word preservation is different from conservation. We will do everything to preserve nature and take only as much as we have to for our survival. Therefore, these two worldviews have always persisted. It's not as if this dilemma has come in only now. But when our understanding of scientific, of science, of the phenomena of nature is growing, the responsibility on us is also that much more in more, more vehement, but that much more stronger. We know the science of it, and therefore it is jolly well our responsibility to make sure that we are nature friendly. Yeah, I can, I, I can see this correlation coming uh, in between with a few words you said. I, I thought when the desires are less, the heart has got lesser to seek out, that you don't uh, tend to harm anything along the way. And secondly, if kindness is ingrained in you and every action is thought in that manner as to what it's going to manifest to something else along the way, then it becomes imbibed in your day-to-day -day activities. You don't have to do something out of the way to preserve or conserve whatever be that viewpoint that you take uh, of nature. Okay, and this right kindness is, you know, is an inspired value. And that inspiration comes from Swami for us. 
I would probably uh, take this opportunity now to open the floor to questions because we've kind of gone into values that Anna felt along his journey that were were uh, important to seeing him reach where it is and is also, uh, I would say, uh, not try to put in a, an academic perspective to the subject matter that he is, uh, he is uh, well, uh, 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 you know, he's well read and learned about, but instead stayed on the perspective of the learnings with Sai in this talk because otherwise he would have probably gone into realms where it would have been difficult to get too many insect stories to help connect the kindness aspect to, to dealing with nature or the, or the cleverness of nature. Let me, um, let me reinforce what you just said, Vankar. I remember my papa, my dad saying on several occasions, if not for Swami, our lives would have been very different. Absolutely. If any one of you have got any questions, it would be nice to take. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the more I think I, I get to hear uh, answers that will sound more, uh, how do I say, with high funda words, it comes back to very simple answers, kindness, love, uh, awareness, being in the moment, uh, so on and so forth. So if you have any questions, please feel free to turn on your videos uh, at the end of the day. This is more like a family for us to talk rather than a forum to have some kind of a, of a gyan uh, session where a person's opinion is coming in. It's all Swami's thoughts and Swami's views coming through these discussions. So if any one of you have got any questions, it would be a good opportunity to ask. You can turn on your cameras if you can or type your questions and I will ask that to Anna. Any one of you? I'm going to give yourself a couple of minutes. Kantarao, Sairam, Sairam, good sir. Sairam, Vinkar. Sairam, Babu, Sairam. So nice, Sairam. really nice, nice talking to, listening to Gopi and also the interaction between Venkat and Gopi. It was a nice opportunity for all of us. And really, it was so nostalgic when uh, Venkat was putting the questions uh, and in fact, quoting Swami, 1979 summer course, the Prakriti and the Purusha, which is Purusha is the permanent and then the Prakriti is the transient. But I, I just want to, I just remembered one of the, you know, and he was also, uh, Gopi was talking about, uh, are we really seeing the same Swami which we have seen, worshipped and then, you know, uh, given Harati to the photographs at home and then, you know, did bhajan. Suddenly we go to the interview room and sit at Swami's lotus feet. It was, it was, you know, really amazing. We, 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 we couldn't imagine ourselves with that proximity. That was, that was really amazing. It really, I, it just stuck to my mind. And more than that, I just reminded of one of the brother's experience when, when Venkat was talking about the, you know, Swami's discourse and some of course. And Swami took one of the brothers in the car. He was taking out and then, you know, and he was asking, Swami was asking that brother, uh, whom do you want to see? Uh, ask, what, what, what is the darshan you want to have? You want to have a Lord Venkateshwara darshan? No, no, no. Because that, that boy, that brother was so, uh, was, he, want, he doesn't want to say anything because he doesn't want to commit, first thing is. And at the same time, he wanted to Swami Mirupan Chalu. He was... Your farm is enough for me. That's what I was trying to say. No, no, no. You ask, you want to have old, old Baba, I mean, uh, old for that is Shirdi Baba's Darshan. You know, he said, no, 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 Swami, no. Then he said, you want to have Narsimha? No, 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 Swami, absolutely no. Then he said, what do you want to have? Then this boy, he thought for a while and he said, to be non-committal, he said, Swami, I want to have Viswarupa Darshan. Viswarupa Darshan, when Swami said, immediately he bent forward and then opened the window and showed him, see, that is the Vishwam. You every day are seeing it, but you are not realizing it. The Prakriti is nothing but the reflection of the same Purusha, which is Swami. That's what Swami said. It was really, you know, it stuck me when you, in your conversation, I wanted to share that. That was a very good one. And of course, nothing more to add when Gopi is a very a prolific orator and also a well-read man and well-experienced also. <laughs> nothing more to add for his uh, talk. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> But we really enjoyed our, uh, that's the best decade of our life and the best days of our 
you know lives rather not life lives in swami's presence that's so true. nice counter of interview in fact we were together <laughs> in the 1986 yeah no, it's nice 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 talking to you uh, no i i i think uh, again uh, what uh, kantara sir just said swami said it also in the uh, speech um, at the atirutra mahayagyam in chennai uh, where he said only when there is love for the paramatma will there be love for prakriti so love for god leads to love for nature because That's nature right. is a reflection of god so that was swami's uh, headline or summary after which it went to all values and all that in 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 the speech at uh, uh, the chennai atirudra mahayagya so uh, i mean these were the few speeches that came when i googled on prakriti to be honest and i was reading it and uh, you 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 reemphasize that uh, statement uh, kantara sir just now it was absolutely it's just uh, prolific to hear those words if anyone yeah, else yes yeah, i know there is uh, in, in, in yet another value we we pick up in swami's presence and before i go further i imagine my daughter her husband and my grandson are also here you know in this group i imagine man and that we have sairam to all of you also uh, and what is it value you know when you when you are in swami's folds and in swami's presence i I am confident that Swami weeds out, weeds out one important dilemma in the mind, and that is suspecting people around. Swami weeds that out. Uh, by weeding it out, you know we look at Swami and accept him in totality, and when we get into this world. we don't have the dilemma of unnecessarily suspecting people to start therefore two things we don't do one is to harm as the prime mover and number two to suspect as the prime mover these are enormous values you know that that swami helps us to minimize chaos in our lives very 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 profound when there is when, when there is no suspicion there is no harm it's always fear that that i mean fear is the source for anger fear is the source when there is attachment i guess it's when you have a connected uh, value or a bad uh, thought then it translates into action so you say weed it out at the thought level so 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 that there is no harm that happens in the action am i right in understanding that yes. absolutely wonderful anyone else uh, questions please i mean it's i i'm enjoying this discussion to be honest and i can go on but then we also have to be mindful of time but if any one of you has got any questions that you may ask we can take a couple of questions more and you know this is how i call all these impromptu satsangs where you don't come prepared <laughs> and he takes care of what he's speaking because he's speaking it's not you <laughs> so it's it's mm-hmm. always interesting yes uh, yes anyone has got anything to say kairam questions anybody <laughs> if yeah, yeah. If there are no other questions let me do my duty to the community of scientists who are working uh, at the global level especially for protection of our planet uh it's it's a unique group of individuals who are um, in fact um, super cats if i can use that word on modeling uh, and i am far removed from that as far removed as delhi to damascus if i can say um, you know but then there is an equally interesting value they carry and that value is to stay unbiased how does it translate into policy it says be clear about two things number one natural variations and number two artificially induced variations mm-hmm. stay unbiased mm-hmm. 
and report on these facts. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an amazing group of people um, who work and take the responsibility of highlighting the phenomena for us. There are scientists who work in frontiers of ozone layer protection. Also. They're an amazing work, amazing work. So, you know, and their agenda is protection of nature and without any hesitation, protection of humanity. Absolutely. I guess when, when, when we have an unbiased perspective, that's when we see truth, right? Otherwise, we chose to allow our ignorance to take forte rather than seeing what exactly stands there. So if, if, there's a, if there's a pursuit of truth, then there should be an unbiased perspective to look at things. And I think that is what the scientific community is doing. So I think we have, we have reached our, 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 our end of our normal session. I didn't feel time going by. Uh, usually, Swami is the hero where the manifestation happens with direct experiences. Here, the manifestation of Swami today has been in the values that he has spoken to us, has been in his reflections that have come. Yes, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, as, as Venkat said, you know, we were trying to bring Professor Sundaration from the Vrindavan campus to speak with us. Um, you know, and then we were waiting for some permissions to come through and things like those. As and when he comes, I'm sure he will also share an experience. We are speaking about Swami and I thought I will share this experience in just a minute. Do we have a time? Uh, uh, just for a minute? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, uh, if I'm right, there's a YouTube on this where Sundaration uh, one day in Fai. Sundaration is one of those most unassuming people. Most unassuming. You know, uh, year-wise, he was one year senior to me. But then we, we, we landed together for PhD and we stayed on and so on. Even now we are in close contact. Now, he's so unassuming, uh, he wouldn't ever go in the front, you know, always stay back. Those typical unassuming guys. Now, what is his divine experience? Swami, one day in Trai, all of a sudden calls out to Sundaration and says, Hey, Sundaration, play this mandolin. Sundaration picks the mandolin. He is sitting somewhere behind. He walks up to Swami, takes the mandolin, goes back to wherever he is sitting, about 10, 15 rows behind, and plays the mandolin. Swami plays the, uh, the, the, the talam. It is a beautiful crescendo. Goes very well. And then um, after, after about a few minutes, uh, they both stop simultaneously. And then uh, a professor there says, Swami, we never knew that Sundaration could play the mandolin. Swami said, even I didn't know, Swami says. You know, and then what does Swami say? I have always seen him play, but this is the first time I'm seeing him play physically. And what did Sundaration do? He would play the mandolin in his room, quietly. Of course, when he plays, people can hear outside. But nobody ever knew that he had mastered the mandolin. And that was the first time ever in front of everybody, Swami made him play the mandolin and said, I knew, but I'm seeing him for the first time physically. I'm repeating it. He has had that joy. And he is, he is a wonderful professor of chemistry, amazing professor of chemistry, who has dedicated his life to Swami, continues to stay in Vrindavan. He is a year and a half elder to me. Uh, you know, and, and then, yeah. Right? He also came from Balbekas. Ravi Kumar came from Balbekas. Kantaro came from Balbekas. So, yeah, like, like many of you, wonderful. My younger daughter went to Balbekas, and my elder daughter is much like a Balbekas child. So, <laughs> Jay Saira. So all I can say is uh, two things. Swami, we will strive to get a bit more organized so that we don't wait for your... Uh, we, we seek your help and grace for this to continue every week because without your sankalpa, nothing happens. 
but let us also do our part. So my apologies for this last minute uh, intimation of today's satsang and also uh, garawing Anna to, <laughs> to come and speak today, literally. But then this was meant to be and everything happens for a reason that he knows. And we get to get our messages for that day in the satsang. So thank you, Swami. Thank you, Anna, for making this happen. We will get more organized to have advanced information of who is speaking the next week. But as always, our prayers continue to Swami to help that happen and allow us to press the buttons and make those messages and permissions to, to happen in place uh, such that uh, we have our speakers uh, well intimated of the dates that they have to speak. With that, my gratitude to all of you to being part of this because I think the energy that we get with each one of us being there every Sunday is in its own way a wonderful uh, positivity Never. that rubs in. Yeah. So gratitude to one and all and gratitude to Swami for making this happen. Let's finish with Samastha Lokas. Samastha Loka Sukino Bhavantu Samastaloka Sukino Bhavantu Samastaloka Sukino Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Jai Bolo Bhagwan Shri Satya Sai Baba Ji Ki Jai. Jai.